God is with us, and let the people say, here we find new life. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Church of Christ in Simsbury. Uh, we are again online only this morning. Uh, those of you who are regular in worship know that we uh, have been worshiping outdoors uh, in the past couple months in addition to coming to you online, but that is impacted by not only weather, but by construction at the church. And this week there is uh, construction going on out in that parking lot in which we usually meet. And so uh, we are back online with you. Uh, please just keep an eye on uh, your email, both for special emails we send out, but even the weekly email this week had information about worship in it. So make sure that you keep an eye on those. We are an open and affirming church of the United Church of Christ. And that means we seek to be intentional in our welcome of everyone. And in particular, I just want to uh, say, because it's important to say that we are intentional in our welcome of gays and lesbians, bisexual, transgender people, uh, queer and, um, and non-binary people. We really, really, really want to make sure that our doors are open to you. And I say that in particular because in Connecticut and in First Church, we sometimes, I think, take that for granted. We live in a happy little bubble. But I just heard a story this morning about a young woman who came out as lesbian and her mother threw her out of the house. And um, she had to go, you know, actually left the state um, to, to, to live with friends. And so this is still all too common and it's why we uh, never ever uh, stop saying that we welcome you and that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You also know if you are regular that I try to uh, greet you with a little quip, just something kind of light and maybe humorous every Sunday morning. But I'm not going to this morning because I actually have something a little bit more weighty to share. Uh, that is that this morning's sermon contains, I guess, what might be called adult content. It follows from the scripture lesson I'm using. And um, I use, I speak to the issue and I use the words uh, rape and sexual assault. Um, there is nothing graphic, but I do, uh, that is the issue. And so if either you are watching with younger children or perhaps if those words and that topic uh, triggers you in some way, makes you uncomfortable, I just wanted to give you a heads up so you're not surprised by my sermon. I will be back with lots of quips next Sunday, I assure you. Let us be together in prayer. Holy One, we bow our hearts before you this day. Strengthen us in our innermost being and dwell in our hearts through faith. May we be rooted and grounded in Christ, whose love is beyond all knowledge. Help us comprehend even the smallest part of the beautiful mystery of your grace. Grant that we may experience the fullness of your presence with us. Amen. you to respond with me if you have your bulletin before you. Uh, in fact, I would just remind you that the bulletins are always available on our Facebook page, so if you want to bring that up and have it uh, on, open on a tab, then you can not only read along, but you can participate in these parts. Come rest your spirits in the Lord. We come hungering and thirsting for God's word. This is a place of peace and hope where all may be fed and healed. Bring us to the time of healing. Come, place your trust in God who is always near you. 
Open our hearts, Lord, to hear your word and feel your presence. Amen. The Bible passage this morning is from the second book of Samuel, from the Hebrew Bible, chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his home. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. Gaffney is an Episcopal priest and professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. She prefaces her commentary on the passage I just read about King David and Bathsheba, saying, the explicit nature of the biblical text calls for an equally explicit conversation about the text. And I argue, she says, that includes from the pulpit. Reverend Gaffney then begins her commentary saying, 2 Samuel chapter 11 tells the story of David's rape of Bathsheba. 
I'll take a little time to unpack the text, draw your attention to a couple things, but we should hardly need a Bible scholar to interpret this text for us. Even a Bible novice reading this story for the first time should draw the same conclusion. Yet preachers and scholars alike have focused on anything but David's rape of Bathsheba. In fact, quite the opposite. Many have turned the story on its head and blamed Bathsheba, identifying her as a temptress to whom David inevitably succumbs. The reading has found its way into popular culture, including in Leonard Cohen's ubiquitous Hallelujah. As if singing to David, Cohen writes, your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. She tied you to a kitchen chair. She broke your throne and she cut your hair. And from your lips, she drew the hallelujah. According to Cohen's telling, Bathsheba is the sexual aggressor, David, the victim of her feminine wiles. Others over the years have charged Bathsheba with adultery, though the Bible makes no such claim. So despite clear biblical evidence, like too many women and girls today, Bathsheba is left to prove that she was raped. Let's remind ourselves what the Bible really says. The first verse says it is spring, the time of year when kings go out to battle. But instead of leading his army as was customary, David remains in Jerusalem and sends his army out to do battle without him. Bathsheba is taking a ritual bath as required by Jewish law to purify herself after her period. Such baths were taken on the roofs of homes so they would offer the women some privacy for this most personal act. Knowing that women cleanse themselves in this way, David likely went up on the roof hoping to see naked women. Today we call this behavior voyeurism or even stalking. As David's men are dying on the front lines of battle, he is fantasizing about Bathsheba. He sends his men to ask about her, learning her father's name, indicating that she comes from a respected family, and also that she is married to one of his decorated soldiers, Uriah. But he is not deterred and sends his men to take her, and he lays with her. In short, David rapes Bathsheba. There is nothing at all in the Bible to suggest that Bathsheba knew or liked David, nor welcomed his advances. The Bible clearly condemns David for his actions, not Bathsheba. In the next chapter, the prophet Nathan, David's advisor, compares David's rape of Bathsheba to a rich man slaughtering a poor man's only lamb. Now, Gaffney draws on the biblical record to identify David as a quote-unquote collector of women. She writes that before he sends men to abduct Bathsheba for his use, David has sexual access to a minimum of six wives. This number does not include servants or slaves and prostitutes with which Israelite men could have sex without consequence. And if David couldn't be any more despicable after Bathsheba tells David that she is pregnant, David orders that her husband, Uriah, be sent to the forefront of the hardest fighting, then directs his general to pull back his troops so that Uriah may be left unprotected and killed. While the passage I read stops just short of this, indeed, Uriah is struck down and dies. David rapes Bathsheba, then murders her husband. So it needs to be said, that David is referred to in the Bible as a man after God's own heart and is widely referred to throughout the Bible as one uniquely beloved by God. I am not going to even try to explain that here except to say that there is no accounting for God's taste in men. In a literary sense, Bathsheba's rape is about David. She is a character in his story used to show how low he sinks, how sorry he becomes, and how much God loves and forgives him. But another scholar, Jennifer Benjamin Brooks, in order to bring the plight of abused women to light, suggests telling the story from the woman 
the victim, Bathsheba's point of view. To make Bathsheba the primary figure and David the secondary, Bathsheba, the victim, has a story to tell that also places her solidly in the annals of history. Beyond her victimization, hers is also a story of courage and strength whereby she speaks for all people, both female and male, who suffer abuse and have that suffering compounded as they are further victimized by those who blame and condemn them. But such a reading requires going beyond the text to some degree because the biblical account is not much interested in Bathsheba's feelings, does not identify the rape as a crime or sin against her, and gives no evidence that God speaks to or on behalf of her. The text is silent, but we can learn a lot from listening to the stories told by women who speak of the mental agony they continue to suffer years after their abuse. The memory and effect of their abuse and victimization becomes an ongoing source of pain that impacts their personal relationships and other areas in their lives. It takes little imagination to see Bathsheba's situation and experience as similar to that of today's abused women or to see each woman victimized as Bathsheba. To see them must be to hear their cries for justice. So, it's a tough read, it's a tough sermon to preach. It is true that David is forgiven by God for his most heinous and selfish act. And this evidence of God's infinite grace and unconditional love is in fact good news for all of us, men and women. But what of Bathsheba? There is little to suggest healing, restoration, repair, or justice for her. Now married, to David, she will be forced to constantly relive the horror. So those who have had such experiences will find little solace here. But, so this is the thing. In time, Bathsheba will reclaim her own power. It's an interesting and little known story that I frankly had not noticed before. It appears in the next book, the Bible, the first book of Kings. Bathsheba and Nathan, remember he was advisor to David, Bathsheba and Nathan successfully advocate with David to get her son Solomon on the throne as David's heir and successor. In Bathsheba's last appearance in scripture, Solomon installs her on a throne at his right hand side gets up off of his throne and bows down before her. I want you to hear that again. Solomon installs his mother on a throne at his right hand side, gets up off of his throne and bows down before her. Gaffney writes that this may well be the beginning of the tradition of the Givera the queen mother as an authoritative office that would characterize the latter Judean monarchy. This text is an important supplement to Bathsheba's rape narrative in 2 Samuel because she survives the rape and David and thrives in spite, in, let, me, let me make sure I get that right. She survives the rape and David and thrives in spite of what it and he has done to her. In the end, Bathsheba claims her power and her son, the king Solomon, bows down before her. I'm very cautious about saying anything that sounds like, don't worry, things will work out in the end, suggesting that the trauma of sexual assault will simply pass to make way for happily ever after. I am not saying that. However, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I believe this to be true, and the story of Bathsheba's installation as Gevera testifies to this. So the real question is, what is our response to those who cry out in pain? How do we see or hear them? Indeed, do we see or hear them? Have we told them God sees and hears them? If we are the hands and feet of God on earth, our responsibility is to see, hear, 
and respond to their pain and be their advocates for justice until they too can take their power back. Amen. Friends, we gather now to share among each other and to lift before our God our celebrations and our concerns, the names and places in our lives that are on our hearts and minds. Uh, I'll mention uh, many on our prayer list and then invite you uh, to mention in the comments uh, those that are on your hearts this day. We pray today uh, prayers of solace and peace for the family of longtime church member Dottie Babcock. Uh, Dottie passed from this life to the next on July 21st. A memorial service for Dottie will take place in November. For Michelle Winkleblack and the Winkleblack and St. Laurent families on the passing of Michelle's uh, mother, uh, or father, I'm sorry. Uh, for Susan Babcock White and Bill White on the loss of Susan's sister, Laura, who passed away from aggressive cancer. For Barbara Hartwell and her family, on the passing of her husband of 72 years, John Hartwell. A memorial service for John took place last Wednesday. For the family of Roy Spear, Roy died last May, um, but his family and friends gathered for a memorial service this past Friday, and we keep them in our prayers. For the Vanderbeck family, who yesterday held a celebration of life for Colby Vanderbeck, who died uh, last December, we pray for uh, the Vanderbeck family and all families um, who struggle for the loss of children and siblings. And we pray for all families um, who struggle and grieve loss um, due to anxiety, depression, and addiction. For Sam and Amber Zappia uh, and their son Carter as they continue to navigate Amber's cancer. For Don Ketchabal, who is in palliative care with terminal cancer, and we pray that he does not suffer. For Ted and Sandy Christensen, as Sandy continues in hospice care. For those who are sick, we pray a speedy and full recovery for 
Ashley Mercer Schwitter's sister-in-law, Louise, following surgery uh, for breast cancer, for Len Clough, who is hospitalized with an infection, for continued and complete rehabilitation and healing for Debbie Skinner following successful back surgery. Um, Don is grateful for the outreach from so many of you. For Courtney Mercer and her family as she continues to respond to the challenges of mental illness, Courtney is the sister of Ashley Mercer Schwitter. For the Reverend Diane Bailey recovering from shoulder surgery. For Lee Ora as she continues to gain strength after heart surgery. For Jim and Rita Bagnell's son-in-law, Douglas, who's undergoing chemotherapy treatment. For Jim Q, as he continues recovering from an infection. And strength and courage for Patty Scanlon. For our wider community and world, we pray for our earth and the deadly consequences of climate change, for those impacted by the rains in Germany and Belgium, which have taken so many lives, and the rains in China, is, uh, they received a year's rainfall in only about three days. So many people displaced from their homes. We praise for those, for those impacted by extreme heat, affecting large portions of the western part of our country. May these events wake us to respond more urgently to the changing climate in our midst. For the continued presence and threat of COVID-19 and the spread of the latest Delta variant, um, cases in many African countries where fewer than 2% of people are vaccinated are surging. Um, and of course, cases here in parts of the United States with low vaccination rates are surging as well. As we uh, enter into this quiet moment of prayer, I do invite you to put in the comments um, whatever it is that might be on your heart this day, on your mind this day, um, where um, in your life would you like prayers of this community and where in your life would you like to mention prayers to our God. Let's be together in silence and then I'll lead us in our pastoral prayer. Loving God, you are our creator, our sustainer. You satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. And so we look to you whenever we are in need, trusting in your love and your abundant goodness. We ask that you would fill those who are empty this day. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, for those nearing the end of life, for those learning to live with permanent health setbacks, complications, or disease. Give them courage and strength for the living of these days. Pray for those who are recovering from illness or surgery. Give them healing. Give them strength. We pray for those who are, who are empty emotionally, who are lonely and long for companionship and love, caught in the grip of depression, or overwhelmed with grief. We pray for those who are spiritually empty, who are troubled but don't know where to turn who long for purpose and meaning but don't know where to look, who need you but do not yet know you. God, we pray for our world as we look at the heavy rains and extreme heat, increased forest fires, we grieve our part in creating a world in which this is a reality. Awaken us to action. As we look at the low vaccination rates and wonder why, oh God, we grieve misinformation and human arrogance. Make us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, even amidst the fear and worry, tears and pains in our lives, we also praise you for the abundant gifts in our lives, the sunrise and sunset, a stretch of cool summer nights in the middle of July, the love of family and of friends, and of course, the love that you have for us. We ask that you fill us with this love, with your compassion, with your understanding, gracious God, and make us always grateful. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Pastor George mentioned in the beginning, um, worship is virtual today. Um, it was planned to be because of the construction out, out where worship typically takes place, but then also the rains came. So we're just going to have to pay attention week by week to weekly emails um, uh, and, and, and figure out uh, where worship is going to be. Of course, for outdoor worship, we always love to see you in person. So if you are in town and the weather is nice and this construction has moved away from that area, um, we will be glad and look forward to seeing you. Um, also, there, there's an opportunity. Uh, so, some, sometimes um, when it comes to helping out people or others or getting involved in, in, in something, it, it becomes a, a long process. But this, this is, is, is hard work, but um, could be uh, something that, that some of you, especially gardeners, might look forward to. I received word that uh, someone um, on our prayer list uh, who's, who um, uh, could, could really use, uh, they've been distracted, of course, because of what's going on in their family, but could really use some weeding around their house. Um, and if this is something that interests you um, as far as uh, organizing, maybe we could get a, a group of folks together. Uh, maybe we could order up some mulch and, uh, and, and get that delivered and, and go over and, and, and take care, of, uh, take care of, their, of their property for them. Um, actually, it's, it's the Sam and Amber Zappia. Um, their, um, their mother reached out because I, I had said back, hey, is there any way the church can support? And no, no, no. And then all of a sudden she said, hey, I have an idea. So it's not something that we would, we would have to do, um, but it's something we, we could do. Uh, so if, if it's something that interests you, um, reach out to me, and maybe we can get, get some folks together. So God invites us to bring our whole selves to worship and to share ourselves with the church, and this includes sharing our financial resources. So let us offer our generosity out of our gratitude for the peace God offers on our lives and world. You can click the donation link in the comments to give to the church. Is a, a saying that when you're on social media, never read the comments because the comments is where all the sort of terrible stuff comes out. Well, I sat down after my sermon and I, I read the comments and there was like this great, great comment in there from Penny Roskin. Thank you, Penny. Her comment was, not enough. Where is the love? And I thought, wow. What a great question. I mean, on so many levels. One is because it sort of suggests the potential of this medium, right? That there is almost a way to sort of interact and, and offer feedback. I also thought, well, you know, why didn't I preach about the love of God? And I think it's because 
I really treated that sermon as a Bible study because I, I really want people to know some of the tough stuff that's in there. And some of that tough stuff that's in there just doesn't, doesn't speak to God's love. Not that I don't and I won't, but I just want people to kind of grapple with the stuff that's in there as it is. But, and, Penny, an answer to your question, here is God's love. May the power of the Holy Spirit made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ. Go before you to show you the way. Go above you to watch over you. Go behind you to nudge you put into places you might not go by yourself. Go beneath you to uphold and uplift you. Go beside you to be your strong and constant companion and dwell within you. That you may know that you are never, ever alone and that you are loved love beyond your wildest imagination. May the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always.